to all right good afternoon good morning good evening whatever time you are watching this i am super excited here because i have with me brandon hall who is um the founder of the real estate cpa um if you you know what actually you know what brandon i think i'll, I'll let you introduce yourself just go ahead and tell the people listening i don't want to butcher it okay but just go ahead introduce yourself tell the people who you are what you do and why we're here after having a conversation yeah well first off thanks so much for having me i really appreciate being here and thanks for everybody for watching this and taking time out of your day to learn about taxes uh, my name is Brandon Hall. I am the founder CEO of Hall CPA, also known as the Real Estate CPA in some circles. Uh, I founded the firm back in 2016. I, mm -hmm. I went full time in 2016. I was on a Bigger Pockets podcast, and that kind yep. of boosted me. Um, and now today, we have uh, like 55 team members in the United States. We service about 800 clients across the United States. Everybody invests in real estate. Uh, we service small clients that are buying their first couple properties and they have high incomes. And we also service really large clients like like funds and 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 syndicates and things like that. So right. we, we've kind of seen it all. It's been a unique perspective. And I'm constantly adding really smart technical people to our team to service everybody in between. And uh, yeah, it's been it's been a real blast. It's it's been it's been a lot of fun growing this thing and meeting a bunch of real estate investors and helping them. That's so awesome. And you've also been very gracious to share your skills and expertise with us, even from as far back as our first um, our first uh, conference back in 2021. I think again in 2022 as well, even. But anyway, but each time that you come on, it's like it's something new we're learning. It's some great gems that you have. So if you're listening to this, we're about to have an amazing conversation. You definitely want to have a pen and paper ready because um, you may hear something new. I don't even know what new thing you hear because I also have my my, 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 my my own pen and paper. So so Brandon, kind of um, tell us, you know, how did you even get into all of this? Like where, where did this start? <laughs> Are you from, was it more so on the real estate side or more on the accounting side? Like how did your, how did your own journey start? So I started, uh, my first job out of college was consulting with PwC, one of the big four accounting firms. Uh, I had double majored in college uh, or double degreed. I'm not really sure if they call it a double major, but it was uh, I doubled in accounting and finance. So I'd always kind of been like in the accounting and finance, um, interested in accounting and finance. But uh, but that first job going working at PwC, great company, really smart people. But I realized really early on it just that was not for me. So I actually started trying to figure out how do you not have a corporate job. And uh, through that, I found real estate. And so my dream was to work my corporate job for some period of time until I could build out a real estate portfolio that would cash flow enough to cover my living expenses. And I would sit on the beach and drink cocktails all day and have fun. Uh, that's where it kind of started. But through the process of learning, I found bigger pockets and I saw a lot of people asking tax questions. And I, I hadn't been formally trained in tax, but I was studying for the CPA and specifically the tax section at the time. So I was like, oh, well, I'll just try to answer these people's questions and do a ton of research. Um, and that was the bug for me. I mean, it was just mm -hmm. a lot of, oh, people are asking questions. I can I can potentially answer this question. Uh, and that creates a positive feedback loop because when you answer it correctly and fully, people go, thank you so much. This is really helpful. And then you go, wow, that's great. I'm going to do that again. Uh, so you get this positive feedback that you're not getting at your day job because you get that once a year at performance review time. So it just, it was like a whole bunch of things that sort of culminated into this, like, oh, this is fun to help people. And I did that for a while without really, I didn't really know what to expect mm -hmm. in terms of turning it into a business. But eventually people started reaching out to me on the Bigger Pockets forum and they were asking, would, would you take me on as a client? Um, and and finally, it happened for a while. And finally, I just said yes to one of the people. Uh, it, there wasn't anything special about it, but I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to say yes. We'll just see what happens. And the rest is history. <laughs> wow. You know what's funny? I feel like, that time frame that you're describing was also when I was pretty heavily on the bigger pockets forums because really I remember that that was that was a time when like I would literally spend like I, Facebook was non-existent to me that that one yeah. year I was always on the forums checking out the new posts checking out the new and I will always see your responses <laughs> <laughs> and that was how I was like okay there 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 is this one guy that does taxes for real estate people. When I yeah. get to like actually like need a real estate question answered in in taxes, then the, 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 he's a person to like go for. So so at this point now you're you're now actually interested in or at least taking that or at least saying yes to people to helping people with their real estate taxes. 
But at what point did you then even start the real estate investing as well? Because I, I know you do you do have some you know assets yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So that was so I think I started on bigger pockets. Like I, I was looking around, I think by the end of 2013. I graduated college uh 2013 and then okay. started my job uh at PwC. By the end of 2013, I think I had started like playing around on bigger pockets, but it wasn't really until probably the middle of 2014 that I really took a, a heavier interest in bigger pockets and answering people's questions and things like that. So by the end of 2014, I had a couple of people that were like, Hey, can you prepare my 2014 tax returns? And they're like really small clients, right? Like I was like, we, I had large clients reach out to me. I was like, yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> I can't, I can't do your stuff. So sorry. Um, but I started really small and that was probably the beginning of 2015. So I, had, I was preparing a few tax returns and and helping people to just kind of ad hoc. Uh, but also beginning of 2015 was when I purchased my first three unit property. So, so I was kind of doing, I was at my day job and then I also had this little side tax thing and then also purchased my first three unit property. Uh, actually I think it was like middle of 2015 that I purchased my first three unit property. Sure. Um, and then September, 2016, I quit my day job and went full-time into my business, which at that point, the income I believe had eclipsed my day job income so that I made, I was confident in doing that. Doing that yeah. Um, but before I quit my day job, I used my W2 to buy another three unit that I moved into. Uh, so I had two, two units covering the mortgage and most of the utilities. So, I, so, and I was living in Washington, DC at the time. DC rents were like 1500 bucks plus $300 a month for parking. So it was pretty expensive. So I was able to eliminate that from my budget um, and de-risk de -risk moving into the business Yeah. Uh, by buying a three unit property. And I know most people not listening to this, of course, but norm normies, the normies out there would probably go, well, you bought a three unit. That's so risky. But for me, it made total sense. It's like, yeah, but if yeah. I can keep the top two units rented and they cover everything and I don't have to pay 1500 bucks a month in rent, I've got a parking pad. I don't have to pay $300 a month in parking. Yeah. Like what else do I have to worry about? 300 bucks yeah. a month in groceries plus like what a car I can sell my car health insurance. That was yeah. my parents were super concerned about health insurance. It's like, that's the least of my concerns <laughs> is getting health insurance. You know, it's like, I'm, I'm concerned that like this business is not going to work. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it, it really simplified the the financial component of mm -hmm. making that decision, and uh, and it allowed me to really go all in on the business and not have to worry or stress and and make um, financially motivated decisions. I think I see sometimes like like one thing with CPAs. So I, co I coach some CPA firms now. Okay. Um, just like from time to time, and people reach out and they're like, "Can you help me with something?" So I guess I should use the word coaching lightly. But yeah. uh, one of the things that I see is accountants try to make too much money in tax preparation. And, uh, and, and I don't mean from like, we, we try to, we underprice things. That, that's not what I mean. What I mean is, uh, you add too much to everybody's plate because you're trying to make a certain margin. You're trying to make a certain amount of cash flow. Uh -huh. Um, and what you should actually do, what we learned at our firm. And I, and I think 2023 was the first year that we successfully like implemented this we've i've known about this for a little bit but 2023 was the real first year that it was like we figured it out um you have to you have to take less money less profit from your tax preparation business uh and and you can't take less profit from your tax preparation business if that's how you make all of your money right so when Got i it. say yes uh, you, you i structured myself to not have to make financially motivated decisions um it allowed me to figure out and it, it took me a long time to figure out because like mm -hmm. la like i said i've been doing this 2016 last year was the yep. first year i would say that's seven years <laughs> we finally figured it out yeah. yeah but the key was hey i'm not gonna i'm not gonna try to squeeze every dollar out of tax prep we're gonna have advisory services we're gonna have accounting services we'll make more money on those but yeah. tax preparation is where you lose clients like everybody hates tax yeah. preparation clients hate it employees hate it because they're all working insane hours clients hate it because you never get any sort of communication back from your, from your accountant and then you get a surprise on 415 and you got to run down to the post office, mail check. It's a terrible experience, but that experience exists because accountants are trying to make 30 to 40% net on their tax return business. And uh, I make the conscious decision to not do that. And the way that I don't do that is I add more labor to the process. Huh. Um, so I add more uh, capacity, which smooths it out for everybody. Yeah. So 
long story sir that was a tangent i apologize but um that is like that those types of decision making yeah um methodologies it's have been with me since day one just buying yeah. the three unit property and killing my rent yeah yeah no yeah that, that that's definitely it's definitely a a good a good point you made because most people that are that are thinking about real estate are thinking of oh well how can i go buy the biggest baddest property out there where sometimes the first place to start may be to even just rein in the expenses that you already have um, rein in the tax bill that you're already paying, for example, as, as we'll talk about um, shortly, or identifying the things that you're already paying for that there are other ways to pay for them that could actually make you money. Yeah. 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 And you yeah. see this too in like the, the syndication space where people yeah. charge large acquisition fees. Well, mm -hmm. the last few years or the last two years, um, it's been a lot harder to acquire any deal that pencils and makes sense. But yep. if you've built your business around acquisition fees, feeding your payroll and your your operating expenses now you're doing deals simply to get the acquisition fee not mm -hmm. because they're actually great deals um and we've seen some of that in the marketplace too so I, i'm just a big believer in trying to not back yourself into a corner from a financial mm -hmm. perspective that mm -hmm. way you have you have choices and flexibility and you can um ideally act in the best interest of the client every single time every single time exactly yep yep so let's talk a little bit about the about the short term rental um, space because I know that in the online in the online discourse environment you were probably among the first few people that began talking about both real estate professional status yeah. and the short term rental strategy. I I call it strategy. I don't I don't like the word loophole, right? Because yeah. because somehow people kind of think of loophole as like you you trying to avoid something that you really should be doing. Um, so. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about um, why short-term rentals are are an important part of someone's game plan if they're a professional who works full-time trying to save money on taxes? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we might have uh, created the monster, the short-term rental <laughs> loophole unintentionally. I know. Um, yeah, I, I mean, before before we put content out on it, I think there was like, there were two tax court cases, Bailey versus tax ba Bailey versus commissioner um, that had happened in early 2000s. And then I think in like 2011. Uh, and then there was an article from the Bradford Tax Institute that had addressed, hey, like these short term rentals, these are an exception to the passive activity loss rules. Um, and we discovered all of that when we did a deep dive on real estate professional status. So we, we always kind of like knew real estate professional status. I say that I think that we knew it well. But what happened in 2020 is we had a lot of people for some reason coming to us and saying, Hey, I'm going to be a real estate professional. Um, I work a full-time job, but like, I, I know that I can qualify and I can qualify because I've got all these education hours and all these research hours. And it happened so often that I finally was just like, I have to like, I have to write an article on this. <laughs> like I, I keep telling people you can't qualify and then they get mad at me. And I, I want them to be, I want them to have good information. Like I want, I want them to be able to, to fact check it themselves before they come to me and hear it from me and, and, yeah. and just think that I'm crazy. Um, so I wrote this huge article. Uh, it, it's still on our website today. It's, it's had yeah. like 40,000 downloads. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, but it's, uh, it's like it, it, if you, PDF, it's like a 38 page ebook, but it goes into exactly how to qualify as a real estate professional, the things that the IRS looks at during an audit, what time counts, what time doesn't count. I go through various tax court cases when the taxpayer won, when the taxpayer lost. So you get a really good fundamental education on that. But while I was writing the article, that's when, uh, in, in one of my partners, Tom Castelli, he, he was helping me. And we discovered, we were like, oh, wait a second, short-term rentals are an exception to this. And short-term rentals right now in 2020 are on the up and up also with the pandemic a, yeah. and everything. Yeah. yeah. So we're like, wait, we should put some content out on this too. Uh, so we ended up recording multiple series um, on our podcast. You can go listen to them still today, but it's like a seven episode series on real estate professional status, seven, seven episode or six episode series on short-term rentals. But to, to get back to your question of why are short-term rentals a big deal, um, real estate professional status is like the apex of tax planning. Yeah. Everybody wants to be a real estate professional because if you're a real estate professional and you're investing in in, in rentals, your rentals are going to create a tax loss most likely thanks to depreciation and the things that you can do to manipulate depreciation like cost segregation studies cost segregation, and, and yeah. front loading <laughs> them. Yeah. 
Uh, so, so if you get all of this tax loss, thanks to this depreciation, the passive activity loss rules say that rentals are by default passive, that tax loss is passive, and you can't use a passive loss to offset non-passive income. Non-passive income is your W-2 income. Uh, mm -hmm. It would be my Hall CPA firm business income because I materially participate in this business. So I can't use rental real estate to offset my W-2. I can't use rental real estate to offset my business. And when income. you say rental real estate in this context, we are referring to traditional rentals where you have a tenant there for a year, mm -hmm. you know, tenant paying rent every month to a landlord. Just Even mid, yeah, midterm rentals as well, because yes. there's a really rentals. small carve out here. So yes. basically, if you anchor your mind to all rental real estate is passive, yes, you will you will win more than you will lose. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so, so, so for the purpose of this conversation, let's just assume all rentals are passive. Okay. Any loss that you receive, uh, you cannot use right. unless you qualify as a real estate professional or meet one of the other exceptions to the passive activity loss rules, mm -hmm. which we're not going to go into right now. There's right. basically two others. Um, for anybody listening, it, it's based on your income or based on if you sell one of the rentals. Those are the other two uh, exceptions. Okay. But the main exception is if I generate this passive loss, but mm -hmm. I qualify as a real estate professional, and if I materially participate in my rentals, then that passive loss is actually a non-passive loss. Mm -hmm. So now I can use the rental <clears throat> losses to offset my W-2 income, my business income, and all that jazz. Mm -hmm. The problem is that one of the one of the two tests for qualifying as a real estate professional is that you have to spend more time in real estate, working in real estate, than you do basically at your day job or in, in if you're running a business full time, that's your day job, right? Uh, so you have to outwork yourself in real estate. Real estate has to be the top, the top hours contributed for the year. So if you're working a full-time job and you spend 2,100 hours a year or 2,000 hours a year in it, you have to spend an additional 2,001 hours in real estate for a total working hours of 4,001 hours during the year. IRS is not going to buy it. The tax court's not going to buy it. Many people have tried. Everybody has lost to date. Uh, having a full-time job and trying to claim that I'm also a real estate professional. Nobody has won that argument yet. I'm a, I'm a firm believer that somebody will at some point, but I don't want to be the one that's taking that position. <laughs> um, so what happens is it, it for, for high income earners, um, it can make them feel like real estate's pointless. Then I'm not getting any tax benefits if I can't mm -hmm. use my tax losses, um, which isn't true. Like there's right. a whole... But yeah. we, we do a whole series of education on that too, because that's just like, yeah, you can't take the tax loss today, but you yeah. have so many tax benefits built into that and it, it gives you options for the future. But that's a, that we can talk about that another time. But anyway, uh, when you get somebody that's like, oh, I just, I don't get any tax benefits. I don't want to do real estate unless I get tax benefits. Uh, that's where that short-term rental starts to come into play. Because a short-term rental is not considered a rental activity under Section 469. Mm -hmm. But Section 469 says all rental activities are passive unless you qualify as a real estate professional. Mm -hmm. So if I don't have a rental activity, I don't have to qualify as a real estate professional. Right. right. So, so a short-term rental where the average period of customer use is seven days or less is not a rental activity under Section 469, which means that if I have that type of rental, I do not have to qualify as a real estate professional, but I do still have to materially participate. So I still yeah. have to hit one of the seven tests for material participation. The two that we see most often are I spend 100 hours and more than anyone else yeah. working on my rental and or sorry, or you only have to meet one of the seven, not all of them. So or I spend 500 hours working on my short term rental. Um, then we get into the conversation of what hours count and don't count. And that leads to a lot of pain. Uh, but that's why short-term rentals have like, like in my opinion, from a tax perspective, blown up over the yeah. past few years. I think coupled with the 2020 pandemic and everybody wanted short-term rentals 2020, 2021, while also realizing at the same time, oh, wow, I can get massive tax benefits uh, as long as I materially participate in these short-term rentals. Um, that's th that's where this is all yeah. coming from. Yeah. So... <laughs> So to kind of summarize what you just said, that basically by by buying and operating a property as a short-term rental, they take that property from falling under rental activity and requiring real estate professional status to mm -hmm. now being in a new category, a short-term rental, based, effectively a business, right? Um, that now, if they materially participate, the criteria of which you just mentioned, 
now that property now falls under non-passive and the losses from it can be used to offset their their you know active or non-passive income like that like that like their w-2 jobs or whatever it is that yep. they're act actively earning income from <clears throat> absolutely yes and when you when you meet that material participation threshold you get to start having conversations around cost segregation studies and then you look at what that's going to do bonus depreciation wise and what that tax mm -hmm. loss is going to be and it becomes pretty lucrative from a tax perspective yeah uh to to do that uh, okay. now it depends also on how you reinvest your tax proceeds. Yeah. <laughs> so if you receive a tax refund and you go and you buy a new car, uh, you know, our firm's going to tell you, don't do that. Um, because at some point, and this is the, a piece that I think a lot of people leave out at some point when you sell the property, and this is not just short-term rentals, it's every rental, uh, you have to pay depreciation recapture tax, right? Yeah. So you, if I buy a property for a hundred thousand, and I later sell it for 95,000, most people would assume, oh, you lost $5,000. Yeah. But your accountant is gonna ask, but what's your adjusted basis? Your adjusted basis is your cost basis minus all the depreciation that you've claimed during the year or during the hold period. Mm -hmm. So if I brought a property for 100 and I claim depreciation of 30, mm -hmm. my adjusted basis is 70. So mm -hmm. if I sell the property for 95, but my adjusted basis is 70, I actually have a $25,000 gain on sale, even though I lost money. Uh, and we're actually seeing that in some short-term rental markets right now, interestingly enough. But I have a gain on sale, and that gain is due to depreciation. It's due to writing down my adjusted basis. So the tax from that is depreciation recapture. I'm so glad that you mentioned that um, even now, because it, it's such an interesting and you know nuanced conversation that sometimes it's like, how can I teach you all the nuances that you need to know in one hour without overwhelming you, but you kind of actually have to know because yes, it's a benefit, but you kind of have to know all these other little things. You do. It's it's important. Um, you know, we've had clients get surprised by it when when they they weren't advised up front or they didn't quite understand. Um, it happens a lot in the syndication world. You know, mm. like a syndicate will liquidate the property and then the K ones mm. come back and there's huge gains on them. And the LPs are all like, what the heck? Why do I have this massive gain? But it's, it's because you took a huge loss at the beginning. Yeah. Um, if you never got to use the loss, meaning it was passive and it was suspended, suspended less of an yeah. issue because it'll offset the gain, right? Yeah. But um, it's better to understand how depreciation recapture works and understand that this this tax move, I think I think the monster that I referred to this, like us kind of accidentally creating was you get your TikTok and your Instagram gurus that are trying to sell you some BS $30,000 courses and crap like that, right? Um, and what they do is is they they sell you on the tax benefits without quite explaining that this it. is a time value of money play. Yep. This is not like a free, free money. thing that you get to, yeah. Like yeah. you have to work, right? So you have to do material yep. participation. But also, it's a time value money play. You're you're going to get some money today from this depreciation, uh, in this tax refund. And you need to reinvest that money because in seven to ten years, you might sell this property and you're going to have to pay it all back. So yeah. you want to be able to reinvest the money and earn something on top of it to make this decision worthwhile from a tax perspective. And that's also why we say don't let the tax tail wag the dog. You need yes. to make this from a financial perspective. This needs to be a good investment, and then this could tap this could tap on. And boost your return a little bit, but it's not it's not the free lunch that yeah. it's often portrayed as. Yeah. And I think people people get shocked by that sometimes, yeah. um, especially typically when they have to sell it on the back end. Yeah. That it's I'm really glad that you brought that up because you know, that concept of time value of money, that, that's really the play that it is, right? Because what 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 I've seen most people actually get is that this is like very rough, quick and dirty type numbers, but very often when they do that initial um, cost segregation study, and then by the time you naturally factor in their tax savings, it usually comes to somewhere around that down payment that they probably put down for the short-term rental. So now they can take the money and go basically do it over and over again. Yes. But if they keep this in mind that this is not free money, then there's actually a reason to keep investing that money. <laughs> Right. So right. that you get that growth over time. Yeah. And there's plenty of tools, right? As long as you yeah. put your money in and you never want to take it out. 
Yeah. You could do 1031 exchanges. 1031. You could do lazy man 1031 exchanges. You could add value, do cash out refinances, rents repeat. Like there's plenty of things to do, but yeah. that's left out of the TikTok and the Instagram guru <laughs> copy uh, because it's not sexy to talk about, right? It's that's too complicated. Why do, let's not talk it's about that. Bad. Who cares about that? <laughs> <laughs> so. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, no, this you're is, gonna this get is... all of your money, and you can buy a G wagon like me, and uh, you know that's the message. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> I was talking to someone recently, and he was like, "You're talking to me about building a portfolio of rentals." I was like, "Yeah, what else do you want to do?" <laughs> <laughs> buy the G wagon. How you, actually, how do you buy just Twitter. one? <laughs> I, I have a uh, uh, on my Twitter account. I started this past December. I saw some like TikTok stuff and there's like a few of these tax people on TikTok that are just terrible. Um, so I started like taking their TikTok videos, posting them on Twitter with my commentary and I had a couple of them blow up. Uh, but then I did one on G wagons and that thing got almost a million impressions. I was like, man, oh my I'm, goodness. I, this is my first like viral, viral post, you know, this is awesome. So I've, I've been, I've been trying to bust uh, the influencer tax hacks and loopholes and loopholes and stuff like that on uh on twitter uh, i need to go find your account what's your what is your twitter account I'm, i've never been uh, yeah i'm at b hall cpa at um hall and uh CPA. yeah i talk about primarily busting the tax influencer loopholes um <laughs> and then i'll post some uh pizza pics every once in a while i i home make pizza Oh, wow. And then, uh, and then, uh, craft cocktails. I recently started doing that. That's been fun. So, <laughs> so well, well, one other question that, that people sometimes have is about the current, um, fade, should I say of bonus, uh -huh. bonus depreciation that, that they can take on the property. Yes. Um, so if, if you don't mind sharing, sharing a bit of, of background on that, and kind of talk about where we are, um, right now with that. <laughs> sure. So bonus depreciation started phasing out in 2023. Prior to 2023, it was 100%. Um, well, thanks to the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, it was 100%. Prior to that, it was 50%. So we've always kind of had bonus depreciation. Yeah. And I was relatively confident, uh, as well as our, our team was relatively confident that at some point, we would see a bill that would extend this. We didn't really think it would ever get back down to zero. Right. Uh, it did happen a lot faster than we thought it would, was going to happen. I will say that. So uh, the way that it's going to work is you get 100% bonus depreciation through 2022. So any asset that you purchase and place into service through 2022, you get to claim 100% bonus depreciation on as long as the useful life is less than 20 years. Mm -hmm. So when you do a cost segregation study on rental real estate, you end up with uh, with five-year, seven-year, 15-year property, as well as 27 and a half-year property. If I just buy that $100,000 home, I have to uh, deduct the cost of land because land does not deteriorate over time. Dirt is just dirt. It doesn't fall apart. But my building, even though it appreciates in value, market value, the building is made up of components that literally fall apart. So depreciation is meant to track that falling apart of the building. Mm -hmm. uh, but Congress has decided that we uh, track that, that cost over 27 and a half years. So 100K uh, acquisition price minus $10,000 of land value equals $90,000 of building value. Divide that by 27 and a half years and you get 3,200 bucks a year in depreciation okay. expense. That's what I get to claim. But if I do a cost segregation study on that property, I'm going to take that $90,000 out of my 27 and a half year bucket and I'm going to allocate some of it, not all of it, but some of it to five, seven and 15 year components, right? My carpet, my appliances, my fixtures, the 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 plumbing and the electrical that feeds the, the appliances, all of that could be considered personal property. Um, so I'm going to allocate value to 5750 in your property, which leads me back to bonus depreciation because bonus depreciation uh, components are bonus depreciation eligible if their useful life is less than 20 years. So the cost segregation study says we're going to take value out of the 27 and a half year bucket and put it into 5715 year buckets. And then bonus depreciation says anything less than 20 years, you can immediately expense 100%. So 2018 to 2020 was pretty lucrative if you're buying rental real estate because, I mean, you'd often buy these like single family homes where you could immediately expense 15 to 20% of the purchase price. Multifamily is like 20 to 30% of the purchase price. You can immediately expense. So you're talking about a million dollar property and you're getting a massive tax write off uh, in the first year thanks to a cost seg plus bonus depreciation. In 2023, it started phasing out. So 2022 was the last year of 100%. 
2023, it went to 80%. 2024, this year, it's 60%. Next year, it's 40%, and so on and so forth until it reaches 0% without any sort of congressional um, uh, uh, extension or anything like that. Yeah. Right now, there is a bill in Congress. It has passed the House. It has kind of stalled in the Senate. So I think that it's still going, it's very popular. So mm -hmm. I think it's still going to pass but I don't know when it's going to pass. And we're all kind of sitting on our hands right now because we have a bunch of tax returns that we need to file. Yeah. <laughs> and we're not, we're not filing the tax returns until we know when this bill is going to pass. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that the, that there's a chance that it could pass between the middle of March and the middle of <clears throat> April, but it includes 100% bonus depreciation retroactive to 2023. Uh, it also includes it in 2024 and I believe also in 2025. So it would start the phase out it would be 80% in 2026. Oh, um, so it okay. just kind of, it just kind of delays it, the phase out. It down. Yep. Okay. Yep. And maybe this is a game that they play every few years as a result. Hey, yeah, I'm definitely one of those people that just like, I don't follow congressional stuff because I'm like, yeah, just tell me what the result is. Um, but this is one that I know that I have actually <laughs> paid attention to because it literally impacts my bottom line. Yeah, because <laughs> we yeah. bought a bunch of properties last year. We closed on one this year, and I'm like, if we got back to a hundred, I will be so happy right there now. There you go. <laughs> there you go. We actually, I don't know if you or anybody is interested, but we actually uh, have a bill tracker on our website where we're updating it. Um, oh, one of okay. our one of our team members is pretty plugged into uh, the hill, so so he's able to give us information that we're then able to update on the blog on the tracker. And what is your website again? Uh, so our website is therealestatecpa.com. Okay. And if you just click on, or if you hover over resources and click blog, I okay. think it's the first like pinned blog right now. So, okay. Yeah. So guys, you heard it right there. There you go. <laughs> you don't <laughs> to need to come back informed. to this video. Just go find it from the source. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> amazing. Amazing. Um, so, so Brandon, um, where can... Where can people find you? Like, you know, let's say someone who's watched this is like, you know what? My accountant doesn't quite understand all these things that you just talked about. Or I've actually had a couple of clients like tell me like my accountant just scared the heck out of me about this thing that you just talked about. Um, who, who can I talk to that actually understands any of this? Yeah. Um, where should I send them to? Where should they go? How can they connect with you? Yeah. Um, so, so you can you can connect with us at www.therealestatecpa.com. That's our mm -hmm. website. Um, you can hit me up on Twitter at B Hall CPA. You can find me on LinkedIn. I don't know what my handle is, but if you Google Brandon Hall CPA LinkedIn, you'll find me. Um, and I'm happy to you know facilitate you know getting consultation scheduled with our firm and exploring this type of stuff. Uh, I will say that the short-term rental piece is about as black and white as it gets. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the challenge is understanding what type of time counts for participation, material participation. Okay. Uh, but the IRS has released some stuff on this too. So it's, if you have an accountant, that's just like, this is too risky. This doesn't make sense. I don't want to do this. Most likely they're just not, they're yeah. not familiar with section 469. Section 469 is pretty complex. Those are the passive activity loss rules. That's where you yeah. find real estate professional status in this short-term rental strategy exception loophole whatever you want to call it yeah um but but that's what we've seen if, if accountants aren't aren't familiar with section 469 then they're gonna push back on this because yeah. they're just not familiar with it which is actually a good thing you don't really want like you don't want your accountant to take all the positions and stuff if they don't really understand because they're not gonna be able to advise you appropriately yeah but um that probably also signals that they don't do this a whole lot so maybe maybe get a second opinion uh maybe look to switch accountants yeah. Um, you know, there, there's a bunch of resources out there now on how exactly this works. So, uh, you don't have to necessarily switch accountants. You might be able to educate them and bring stuff to them. Yep. Um, but you are the one that's ultimately signing your tax return. So you need yep. to make sure that it is prepared correctly and accurately. That is that last piece that there is the, is the, is the real thing. Cause at the end of the day, however it's prepared, you're the one signing it. So you might as well get your yep. deductions. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> so let's, since you brought up actually, let's just talk very br briefly about what kind of activities um, can be can be counted as material participation. So for those who are wondering what, what, what we mean by material participation, these are the activities that you need to keep track of 
You need to basically make a log of the time you're spending doing these things for your property so that you can meet the 100 hours and more than anybody else or the 500 hours without a regard to anybody else. So remember, there are two options there. There are more than these, obviously, but these are the two that most people go with. 100 hours by you and more than anybody else. So you keep track of yours and other people. Yep. And then the 500 hours without regards to anybody else. Yeah. And before we get into the actual time that counts and doesn't count, uh, I just want to reiterate that you do have, to, if you're going to hit 100 hours more than anyone else, you do have to track everybody else's time in the activity, which is challenging to do. But you can do that with like door codes and ring cameras and stuff like that. But if you're audited the I and you're and that's what you're claiming, you will have to prove that you outworked everybody else. And, mm -hmm. and so you will need a time log. And uh, if you don't have one, the the IRS won't accept it and then tax court won't accept it either. There was actually a case, Lucero versus Commissioner, I believe it was back in 2020 or 2021, where that's what they claimed and they couldn't prove that that they didn't track the time of anyone else. Mm -hmm. working on the activity so they couldn't prove that they spent 100 hours and more than anyone else so they mm -hmm. ended up losing uh the case i mean they lost for a number of other reasons as other well reasons, but that yeah. was one aspect of it so this is a very serious thing and, th and that's the other thing too it's like if you're just going into this haphazardly and you're like oh cool i just got a fifty thousand dollar refund like you're doing it wrong yeah <laughs> this is this is an administrative lift you have to commit so uh what time counts and doesn't count the the easiest way to talk about this is to talk about what time doesn't count um, because the time that does count is pretty expansive. So the time yeah. that counts is going to be like, like imagine if you hired a property manager, mm -hmm. that's what time counts. Uh, okay. they're managing the property on a day-to-day -day basis. They're managing the, the listing, the photos, the contractors, the repairs, the, uh, the check-ins, the checkouts, the guest communication on an ongoing basis. Uh, the utilities, if the Wi-Fi is down, they're troubleshooting that, right? So they're they're there, they're on site, they're managing it on a consistent basis. That's what time counts. If and, you're the, and, being the property and just manager. to be clear, he means that as a as an analogy of you doing those things. Correct. Just, just to be very yes. clear. <laughs> just to thank you for that clarification. Yes. Yes. If you have a property manager, you are probably toast. So yes. you have to do it. Uh but but what I like to do is talk about what time doesn't count yeah. because the time that doesn't count is the time that everybody wishes counts. So the time that doesn't count are going to be investor level hours. Investor level hours are time spent doing the bookkeeping, managing your finances, paying bills, preparing your tax returns, reviewing property management reports, doing the underwriting on properties, communicating with my lender and my title attorney and all that. None of that time counts unless you are managing the day-to-day -day of the asset, okay? Hmm. So if you're not the one that's managing the day-to-day, -day, none of that time is going to count. Now, that also doesn't mean that, oh, well, I'll just do all the bookkeeping and the bookkeeping is going to take me three hours a month. Um, and then I'm also going to manage all the bill pay. And then I'll have somebody on site that I'll just kind of coordinate with periodically. That's not really managing the day to day either, right? You got to be managing everything. You got to manage the workflow of the the tenants coming in, the getting the cleaning done, the inspections, the quality inspections. You got to manage all that, all right? So you have to you have to self manage this. If you self manage this, those investor level hours can count. Okay, you can with an asterisk. Make sure that you double check with your CPA on that. Yeah. Um, the second bucket of hours that does not count are education hours and research hours. Mm. Now, that's a big bummer because we would all just love to listen to podcasts all day long. And I'd love to just sit there and look at the MLS all day long and say, hey, I'm materially participating. But the reality is, is that that education and that research uh, does not does not really provide a noticeable economic impact to my rental property. And that's kind of the litmus test is yeah. if the time that you're spending is not going to make your property collect way more rent or significantly reduce expenses, then it doesn't count. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm not there swinging a hammer. I'm not there checking the guests in. Uh, I'm sitting at my computer, listening to a podcast passively. That time's not material participation, right? Yep. The last bucket of time that doesn't count is travel time. Again, with an asterisk, uh, -huh. uh travel time is kind of challenging. Yeah. If you, if your travel is integral to the day-to-day -day operations of the, of the management, then your travel time can count. But what is day-to-day -day operations? What does that mean? Uh, there's a tax court case, Laver's Commissioner, where the taxpayer had a bunch of local rental properties and visited them daily. Uh, and the travel time ended up counting. The travel time to and from those rental properties ended up counting for that taxpayer. 
There are numerous other cases where the taxpayer had a business or a rental property that was multiple hours away. That Lucero case that I referenced uh, a few minutes ago was one such case where the properties were like an hour and a half and two hours away from their home and they visited them six to eight times a year. Travel time didn't count. So if it's not integral to the day-to-day -day management, the day-to-day -day operations, then your travel time is not going to count. But investor level hours, education, research, travel time, those are all the hours that we want to count because why? Those are the simplest things yeah. <laughs> to log, right? I can do that from my home, but uh, but that's not actually managing the property. It's not actually uh, managing the, the communications and the guests and, and everything involved in the day-to-day of that property. So you just have to be careful with that because, and by the way, finding a CPA that allows you to count that time is not a good thing because <laughs> they're, they're, what, what are they doing? If they're going to allow you to count it, they're going to allow everybody else to count it. All it takes is a few of their clients to get audited until the IRS realize they've struck gold. Uh, and then the audits become way less random, right? We all have prepare mm -hmm. identification numbers. They're just going to pull every single return that that CPA prepared and gave that bad advice to, and you're going to get roped into that audit. So just be really careful. Like you have to be the master of due diligence here. Yeah. Uh, you you can't just have confirmation bias, which we see a lot, mm. especially with high income earners. Oh, well, this guy said that I could do it this way. So that's just the easiest route. You really have to fight that and you have to take a deep breath and go, but is that actually the correct advice? Mm -hmm. um, because if they're giving that advice, if they're giving bad advice to you, they're also doing it to everybody else. Mm. And it just exposes you to risk that you may not be aware of. Okay. Okay. So <clears throat> that was a long monologue. I've no, oh, no, 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 no. It, it, it's definitely helpful because as you were talking, I was like, okay, did I count that? Did I count that? So let's think about like a, a, uh -oh. a remote property, right? Like a property, like we just, we just bought one in Texas now. Yeah. Um, and we had to travel down there to go, you know, get the property up, up and running. And we, and we logged all the hours while we were there. Um, but we plan to self-manage from up here in Syracuse, even though we'll have a housekeeper that goes, we're tracking those hours. We're tracking the hours of the contractors, um, and, you know, just making sure that we're not allowing anybody go past a hundred hours because yeah. now we've already log logged, um, 62 hours with, 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 with one trip. Yeah. So now I'm just like, okay, let me just make sure in my head. <laughs> well, there, there are ways to finagle it. I mean, I mean, you can absolutely, but you got to have a strategy, right? And, and what a lot of, what we see a lot of people do is they'll buy that house in Texas. Mm -hmm. They'll do some initial repairs and then they'll go back up to Syracuse and then they basically won't be involved. Um, mm -hmm. May, it's frankly, when people are really good at building out teams, guess what? Your material participation hours go down. Yeah. Um, so we see a lot of that. So you just have to have a good strategy on yeah. how am I going to get my material participation hours? Yeah. Uh, and, and you can do this year by year too. Like maybe one year you just, you aren't able to swing it. Well, mm -hmm. look at it for the next year instead or the third year or something Like you don't have to do this specifically every, in the every one year. year. Yeah. Uh, but it is important to, to not like, I, I think that, um, you know, the IRS is getting AI capabilities. I think that you'll probably start to see a lot more uh, of these types of audits come down because people yeah. are taking non-passive losses while they have W-2 income. And that's mm -hmm. going to be like a flag for, oh, this person is not a real estate pro. And then you're going to be in the seat of explaining this short-term rental exception. And yeah. I think that we'll probably see a lot more of that come down. Uh, so just just be ready, be prepared, have your documents in order. Yeah. And one last clarification too that I do want to make is, you can make that trip down to Texas. It could still be a business trip, meaning yes. that it's deductible, but yeah. the hours just don't count for material participation. So exactly. section 162 is business expenses. Section 469 yep. is passive activity loss rules. They don't really cross-reference. So right. you can have one and not the other. Right. Yeah, that that absolutely makes sense. And the other thing also is if we even if even if right, I mean, right now that that one is at is at 62. We still have all the other material participation that we have with all the, all the other properties that if we somehow get to, you know, 500, then then it's then all the then everything can can basically be lumped together. Um, but yeah, like you said, it's important to have the strategy behind what it is that you are that you're working on. Yeah. Yeah. You do yeah. have to be careful with that grouping rule. So okay. that, that lumping together is in treasury reg section 14694-4 uh -huh. uh, and there are um certain limitations to what you can and cannot group so just make sure that you okay. run that by your if you're like listening to this and you're like oh yeah i want to do that uh, make sure that you run that by your accountant and have a really good conversation around it play through some scenarios just to make sure that that grouping election is valid okay 
what are some situations where it won't be valid? Like, um, if if you are thinking, okay, this is it is it based on property location, property type, how much time was spent? Well, there's several factors to the grouping, okay. what you're allowed to group. Uh, one okay. of them is geographic region. So okay. it, it's not a controlling factor, but it is a factor. So it's kind of more of a, um, you basically need a tax pro that has reviewed all the tax court cases on section 469-4 or reg section 469-4 and can weigh those factors while you're making a grouping determination. Yep. Um, so again, if you're using like an accountant that doesn't do this all day long, you're probably exposing yourself to some risk. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. All right. <laughs> okay. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brandon. Definitely got my own juices flowing thinking about all of these um, today. I told you guys that I always, I, I, I said it, if you didn't have a pen and paper, whoops, go back, hit replay, hit rewind, go watch it all over again. Um, but thanks so much for being so gracious with your time and um, just wealth of knowledge and information. Um, guys, remember, he's, he's given us his his uh, his website, www.therealestatecpa.com, as well as Twitter handle, at bhallcpa, and I think that's it. Oh, yeah, and then, of course, the, the blog link that, he, that you mentioned, yeah. mentioned earlier. Any, yeah, last, yeah. Any, any, any last thoughts you want to leave the, the um, listeners with? Um, I, yeah, just, one last thing is just, Educate yourself on how these rules work. They are complex, but I promise if you read them and then you read them again and you read them again and maybe listen to our podcast, it'll start making sense. Yeah. And and you know you don't have to be more sophisticated. Your knowledge does not have to be more sophisticated than your tax pro. But I think what I see is is people that don't have any sort of understanding. Um, they fail to ask good questions to mm -hmm. their tax pro. And so they end up taking risks that they're unaware of. Got uh, it. So my, my challenge to anybody listening is if you're going to claim real estate professional status, if you're going to run this short-term rental strategy that you spend a few hours educating yourself on how it works, um, the ins and outs, the technical jargon that might not make sense to you on the first pass, mm -hmm get get comfortable with some of that because uh, you will be able to ask your accountant more pointed questions and you're, you'll get a lot more value out of working with an accountant if you can build some base level of knowledge for yourself. Makes sense. Makes sense. Thank you so much, Brandon. Really appreciate your time. Guys, remember, realestatecpa.com. Thanks. Take care. Thanks for having me.